All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Rockefeller, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Travis Evans. Hello, Travis. Hi, everyone. Travis and I are lawyers in Gallings Hamilton office, where we split our time between lending, corporate, and loan recovery practices, working with financial institutions, private lenders, and borrowers of all different stripes. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We hope you're all doing well. In this short 25 minute session, we'll be speaking on a subject we all deal with on almost a daily basis, and that is signing documents. Um, it's a seemingly elementary topic, but we hope that you'll come away from this with some practical guidance around making sure your documents, whether they're paper or electronic, are being properly executed, regardless of whether the parties are signing the old fashioned way or in digital form. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach here is to briefly go over the basics of contract formation and how you can get comfortable with the authority of the people who are purporting to sign on behalf of the corporation, partnership, or trust you're dealing with. And then we'll get into the formalities of signatures and signature blocks to help you understand what you're looking at on a signature page. Once we've covered off those basics, we'll be speaking on the effect and enforceability of electronic documentation and some best practices around taking electronic signatures on your documents. After we're through our presentation, we're going to head over to a short Q&A session where we'll be happy to connect with you and take any questions you have. Next slide, please. So it is, uh, it's well established what the basic requirements are for the formation of a contract. Um, you, you have an offer, you have acceptance of that offer, you need an exchange of value or what we call consideration. You need certainty on the agreed terms and you need an intention to create a legal or binding relationship. And we can quickly make out from this list that the absence of a properly signed document does not necessarily mean that these elements have not been satisfied. So as a general rule, a personal handwritten signature or some other kind of marking and even having the contractual terms committed to writing, these are not prerequisites for the formation of a contract, generally speaking. Next slide. There are exceptions to every rule, though, and some contracts must be in writing and must be signed. And this is a requirement of, for example, uh, provincial legislation that's enforced in many provinces, which is commonly known as the statute of frauds. Um, you may have heard of it. It's a very short piece of legislation if you look at it, and it's there to protect people when they engage in oral negotiations from unintentionally binding themselves to an agreement before anything is committed to writing and signed. It has very limited application, but it covers things like agreements to transfer land, land leases, and guarantees. Similarly, in, um, in Ontario and in some other provinces, the, the PPSA, or Personal Property Security Act, which we're all familiar with, um, it requires, with limited exceptions, that all security agreements be signed, and naturally then that they're also um, in writing, before they can be considered enforceable against third parties. But as we'll see, and I'm just so I'm kind of helping everyone along with the train of thought on this, neither of these statutes are prescriptive about what qualifies as being in writing and what qualifies as an agreement being signed. Um, and we'll get into this a little more in, in, in a couple of slides. Um, over to you, Travis. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, so the next part of this presentation in the next few slides, <clears throat> we'll deal with signing authority. Uh, in, in particular, how corporate authority is confirmed for the, ba the banking relationship as a whole, as well as on an ad hoc basis for each loan transaction. So if you're lending to or you're taking security from a corporation, it's essential to confirm that the corporation is authorized to borrow money and grant security and also confirm which directors uh, and officers are entitled to sign on behalf of the corporation. So it's important to always bear in mind as an underlying principle that a corporation is a distinct legal entity. And, can, and what I mean by that is it can only operate at the direction of its directors and officers. <clears throat> and in some cases, with respect to more fundamental matters or if there's a shareholders agreement in place, it's shareholders. So for the purposes of this discussion, the corporation's authority to generally transact business with the bank, we'll call that banking authority. So banking authority is established at the inception of the banking relationship. And I want to stress that point uh, because uh, that authority is established at a particular point in time. Uh, the bank will obtain the confirmations it requires uh, to establish banking authority at the outset of the banking relationship using a standard form uh, intake or file opening documents established for that purpose. And the exact practices will vary by lender 
uh, but, but typically it's established by obtaining a few things. The first of which is a certified copy of a resolution of the directors appointing the lender as the corporation's lender. We also get a certificate from the directors confirming uh, any specific directors or officers that are authorized to sign checks uh, in, in agreements, borrowing money, or to give security and guarantees. And that certificate will also uh, outline or, or certify the current list of officers and directors of the corporation. So some lenders will also require a corporation to enact at that stage a borrowing bylaw, which authorizes the corporation to borrow money, to grant security, and guarantee the debts of others. Whether this is actually required depends on the circumstances, but it's often a redundant practice because enacting a borrowing bylaw is a standard part of the incorporation and organization process in the vast majority of cases. On occasion, if, you, if you're dealing with a corporation a startup, for example, where the founders have incorporated the company online, they may not have engaged a solicitor to properly organize the corporation, and therefore they might not have a borrowing bylaw in place. And in those instances, it is important for the bank to ensure that's in place. Uh, but generally speaking, the borrowing bylaw, borrowing bylaw rather, is such a staple of the incorporation process that it's actually more common practice now to include those authorizations directly in the articles of the corporation rather than in the bylaw. So it's worth noting <clears throat> that in, in the past, it was common practice uh, for a corporation to appoint a specific lender as their banker. It was a bit of a status symbol to say that a particular bank was, was the corporation's uh, lender. And in those cases, the borrowing bylaw would be limited to borrowing from a specific lender, and in some cases, uh, up to a specific amount. And we still encounter those sorts of borrowing bylaws on occasion. Uh, so in those instances, uh, it is necessary to adopt a new, more generic borrowing bylaw uh, that's not specific to any, lend any lender or any amount. Uh, those instances are increasingly uncommon, but we, when we do encounter them, uh, it's usually when you're dealing with a small or mid-sized family uh, business. Uh, they've been operating for a number of years. They don't engage in a lot of transactions, so they just haven't really kept their corporate uh, records uh, up to date. Next slide, please. So banking authority is only obtained at a particular point, like I said, and it only generally relates to the day-to-day -day banking matters of the corporation. And I say this is important because the directors and officers of the corporation, as well as the overall management structure in terms of uh, who's authorized to sign documents, uh, will likely change from time to time. So it's important to update those confirmations in connection with any particular lending tra transaction or whenever new security is obtained, for example. In the context of an actual lending transaction, corporate authority is generally confirmed by obtaining a certificate from a senior officer of the corporation. Uh, that certificate will be dated as of the closing date uh, of that particular transaction to ensure those confirmations coincide with the closing date. The certificate will contain various confirmations relating to the confirmation to the corporation rather and will attach certain uh, certified copies uh, of the constating documents and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Uh, the content of the certificate can be customized to the transaction but it typically contains a few things. First, uh, a certification that a true copy of the articles of incorporation and any amendments to those articles are attached. A certification that the true copy of the bylaws are attached, and this is the opportunity for your solicitor to review those bylaws and make sure they're sufficient for that transaction. A certification that any uh, shareholders agreement is attached, and it's a true copy if one exists, uh, so that any necessary, uh, and also a certification rather that any necessary shareholder approval has been obtained if it's required. This is important in determining if, if the shareholders have restricted the powers of the directors in any way, such as shareholder approval to the loan or the security documents is required in addition to director approval or in lieu of, of director approval. Uh, the certificate will also confirm various factual matters relating to the corporation. Uh, these can address any particular concerns that the lender has, but there's usually a, a standard suite of uh, uh, facts that are set out in the certificate. For example, that there's no material litigation ongoing or threatened. Uh, that would impact the corporation's uh, financial well-being. It would certify the, corp uh, the location of the corporation's assets and, and the head office address of the corporation. And there'll also be a separate certificate attached to the officer certificate, and that is the incumbency certificate. And this is where an officer signs a certificate certifying the name and title of each officer and director of the corporation, uh, or at least the officers and directors that will uh, sign transaction documents on behalf of the corporation. And they'll also include a specimen signature uh, next to their name so that the, the lender can compare those signatures against the signatures on the loan documents if they need to. Uh, 
Now, the last attachment is usually the authorizing resolutions, and I'll discuss those in more detail on the next slide. But in general, the officer will certify that all corporate approvals have been completed and certify that the relevant resolution is attached to the certificate. So as a bit of an aside, I've been talking about corporations a lot, uh, mostly because these are the entities you'll, you'll encounter most often. Uh, but it's important to note that when you're dealing with a borrower or a guarantor, that's a partnership, whether a limited or a general partnership or a trust, uh, a similar certificate is obtained, but with attachments and confirmations that are specific to the partnership and the trust. So for example, rather than the articles of incorporation being attached, the trust deed uh, will be attached or the partnership agreement will be attached. Rather than obtaining confirmation of the officers and directors, you would obtain confirmation of the current trustees uh, or the partners of the partnership. That being said, the overall structure of the certificate is largely the same in each case. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the certificate has attached to it uh, the necessary director or, if necessary, the shareholder resolutions authorizing the actions required to complete the loan transaction. So the resolution can be signed by all of the directors or shareholders if shareholders are required to sign or an officer can simply certify that the resolutions have been passed. Now, the best practice, of course, is always to obtain the signature of each uh, director and shareholder if necessary, so there's no doubt that the resolution has in fact been passed. Your customer's counsel may on occasion request that an officer merely certify that the resolutions have been passed, and that's usually if there's a lot of directors and shareholders, and obtaining all of those signatures would be challenging for whatever reason. Uh, so you should consider those requests on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, with your counsel to ensure there's no fraudulent activity taking place where an officer may certify uh, that director and shareholder approval has been obtained when in fact it has. The resolution should also include specific language such as the borrowing of funds and entering into the loan agreement is explicitly approved or if the loan agreement has already been signed in advance of the resolution and the resolution resolution needs to ratify that act. And by that I mean confirm it. So each transaction security document should also be explicitly uh, set out, described in, in a little bit of detail and approved. As well. And with respect to authority to execute the document, <clears throat> to simplify the process and allow for, for a bit of flexibility, the resolution will often permit any one director or officer uh, acting alone to execute those documents uh, with any alterations or amendments that they, they might approve. However, your counsel should ensure this resolution does not contradict uh, any particular signing authorities that might be set out in the bylaws or any shareholders agreement if one exists. So again, in the case of trusts or partnerships, a similar resolution would be attained uh, from the trustee in the case of a trust, the general partner when you're dealing with a limited partnership, or all of the partners uh, when dealing with a general partnership. Next slide, and I'll turn, turn it back to you, Eric. Thanks, Travis. So, um... So what is in a signature or, or rather a signature page? Um, so the first element of the signature page that we want to look at is what's called the testimonium. The testimonium is that often unreadable line at the top of the signature page, which you read, it says something like something very self-evident, like um, whereas the signatures below mean that we're signing this document on this date. Um, the point of the testimonium is really as straightforward as you're presuming. It's, it's just a declaration by the parties that the agreement is in fact signed and delivered. And it goes back to the prerequisite, which we discussed at the outset for contract formation, that there needs to be an intention to create, to create legal relations. And this is just more evidence of that um, because it's so important to the formation of an agreement. So it, it's, it's meant to protect uh, from an instance where the other party comes back later with some silly defense and says that even though they signed it, they didn't intend that it actually uh, would become an agreement to be bound. Um, now, you would think that because it's intended to be clear evidence of this intention that the language itself would be clear, but you often get this antiquated nonsense um, of that you see here on the slide, in witness whereof the parties have hereunto set their hands and seals, etc. cetera. Um, it's not to say that the, those words are meaningless, um, but we would propose if you're the one getting the draft of the agreement up off the ground, just use plain language, something like we have here, agreed to by the undersigned as of the date first written above. And we tend to leave the date off the signature page so that things can be signed in advance and then delivered and released when it's to be made effective, say on closing. Um, we also typically add a footer to the signature page just to identify the document in case you get your signature pages back after closing loosely in a stack and you need to start putting them into agreements. Um, the next element is attestation. This is the signed, sealed and delivered in the presence of language that you sometimes see. It's language um, 
by by which the the witness declares that they have in fact witnessed execution. Now, because it's again somewhat self-evident from a witness signature what it actually means, you'll often see this language dropped from a signature page, particularly where no seal is affixed to the document. But that's really all it is. And we bring this up though, just to make the point you see here on the slides that while most documents do not technically need to be witnessed in order to be legally valid. Um, signatures by individuals on certain real property and other documents do have to be witnessed by statute. And since most FIs will have their own forms of signature blocks and policies around witnessing um, individual signatures, the best practice off often dictates that you insist on witnesses where it's an individual signing on their own behalf and not on behalf of a company. If you get an individual signature back that doesn't have a witness, um, insist on it being re-executed. Witnesses are there for evidentiary purposes. So if a party to the agreement later says that they didn't sign, the witness can be called to speak to that issue. Um, and for that reason, we suggest that you leave a little bit of room on the signature page um, and, and a field for somebody to fill in what their name is and, and some address and other contact information so that they can be located later on. Um, as it says here, co corporate signatures are um, almost never witnessed. And that's because, again, the signing officer's authority and their signature itself are certified under the officer certificate and resolution. Instead, you'll often just see this short statement at the bottom of the signature block, which says, I have authority to bind the corporation. And that's to reconfirm the proper authority of the signing officer and, and sort of create the argument down the road that no, this person was, was being held out as being authorized by the company to sign the documents. Next slide, please. Okay, a very brief word on seals. The questions we often get are, my borrower doesn't have one, so should I put CS or some other notation on the signature block? Or they do have one, so do they need to use it? The short answer is corporations in Ontario are not even required to have a seal. A seal. And while there is some meaning and effect behind a contract being quote unquote under seal, which we don't need to get into here, um, the application of the seal is not required in almost all cases you'll encounter. If a borrower is insisting on signing under seal, maybe just ask why and then consider speaking to your counsel about it. In either case, whether you're in that scenario where it's not needed that 95% of the time or that rare instance where it is or the party's insisting on, on signing under seal, just make sure that the signature page reflects the intention of the parties, whether to enter into it under seal or not. And again, in most cases, you won't need it. So just get rid of that sealed language. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next few pages are examples of signature blocks. Um, we don't propose to get into them in too much detail here. Have a look um, during the session or after, and then when we hit the Q&A, um, feel free to ask away and, and we can answer your questions about those. There are some intricacies about them and some, some uh, otter signature blocks like the trust signature block. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, back to you, Travis. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, so the second half of this discussion relates to the validity of electronic documents and signatures <clears throat> and some best practices when you're using them, uh, but particularly in the lending context. So obviously the use of electronic documents and signatures, uh, it's become increasingly common in recent years, nearly universal, uh, really, and, and even more so as a result of COVID-19. So we thought it'd be prudent to provide a quick primer on the topic. Uh, in Canada, the use of electronic documents and signatures is not heavily regulated, and, and by that I mean the regime is not overly complex or restrictive. Uh, that said, uh, they are subject to a statutory regime that establishes certain requirements relating to both. The most important of which is at the provincial level, and that's in Ontario, the Electronic Commerce Act. Uh, so it relates to electronic documents and signatures, and all of the other provinces and territories other than Quebec uh, have enacted <clears throat> pretty su substantially similar uh, legislation to the ECA with some minor modifications. Uh, but, but in each case, the provincial statutes, including the ACA in Ontario, are the main pieces of legislation relating uh, to electronic documents. I also have PIPEDA up there, uh, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. I won't get into that um, in, in the International Electronic Communication Convention Act. Uh, both of them have a bit of applicability to electronic signatures and documents, but uh, limited um, applicability. So if you do have any questions about those, feel free to ask them during the Q&A. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, the electronic contract regime in Ontario is not particularly restrictive. <clears throat> uh, if you recall, Eric mentioned the provincial statute of fraud, uh, which requires certain types of agreements to actually be in writing. Uh, the ECA goes a step further <clears throat> in broadly stating that, except with respect to certain types of documents, and Eric will, will mention those in a moment, uh, a, a document is not invalid or unenforceable only because it's an electronic form like a PDF. Uh, in fact, as long as the document can be accessed for subsequent reference uh, after being signed or otherwise accepted, again, like a PDF, uh, it, it generally satisfies any requirement of the document being in writing. Uh, for example, under the statute of fraud, uh, under PIPEDA, um, or under certain sections of the PPSA that, that Eric mentioned earlier. But one element of the regime uh, is, is consent. Uh, a party cannot be compelled to accept documents in electronic form, uh, despite them being so common. Uh, so some form of express or uh, implied consent is required from both parties. Now, express consent would ideally take the form of an actual contractual provision where both parties consent to the use of electronic documents. Uh, in my experience, this type of consent is actually still surprisingly uncommon uh, in most agreements. Uh, so best practice would be to have your loan documents reviewed and revised accordingly. Uh, if that's how you handle your, your loan document. Um, the, sometimes the electronic document consent is couched in the counterparts clause of your agreement as well. Um, and Eric will mention that uh, in just a moment. But consent can also be implied, like I said. It can be implied like from a person's conduct if there are reasonable grounds to believe that the consent is genuine and is relevant to the information uh, or document. But again, it's always best to, to rely on an express provision in your agreements rather than implicit consent. So provided these requirements are satisfied, generally speaking, a document in electronic form is the functional equivalent of a document in paper form. The next slide, please. So I won't bore you uh, too much with the, with the law of contracts, uh, but it's just worth noting that there are a few key elements, and Eric alluded to them earlier, to the formation of a valid contract. A few of them are offer, acceptance, and a meeting of the mind. Uh, and the reason I mention this is that all of these elements can be expressed electronically through many means, uh, of which actually signing the agreement is just one. And in fact, some cases, uh, in some cases, courts have went so far as to find that a binding agreement was created and all of these essential elements of a valid contract existed through an email exchange alone, even though the parties never really entered into a formal contract and signed it. And so we talked a bit about the statutory regime. Uh, but it's worth noting that the courts have also generally embraced electronic contracts as they developed um, over the years. This is nothing new. For example, you, everyone on this call, I'm sure, has has entered into click wrap agreements, which are those annoying uh, terms and conditions that come up when you use certain websites or, or platforms. Occasionally, they'll have you uh, scroll to the bottom to click accept. That, that's the click wrap part. There's also browser app agreements, uh, sometimes called terms of use. They usually sit as a little hyperlink at the bottom of a website. Uh, and you are deemed to consent to that agreement and be bound by it just by virtue of using uh, the website or the platform, which sounds a bit odd. And for that reason, the enforceability of those types of agreements are, are debatable. Uh, and then you have end user license agreements, which you'll usually get uh, when you purchase a piece of software and boot it up for the first time. Uh, you'll see, again, terms and conditions that you need to scroll through and accept. And that's, that's the license relating to the software. So the point here is that electronic contracts are nothing new, uh, and there's a good deal of authority to support their validity and enforceability. It's not the, uh, you know, a fringe area of the law that's just come about. Uh, so that's it for me. Back to you, Eric. Right. So Travis is, has been talking about electronic contracts generally, um, broadly speaking. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about electronic signatures. Um, so the Electronic Commerce Act, again, um, it has a fairly opaque and unhelpful definition of what an electronic signature is, but we're usually talking about either digitized signatures. So there you can think of my handwritten signature that I then scan into my computer and drop into documents from time to time and encrypted digital signatures um, using encryption software. Think of something like DocuSign. Um, Travis touched on the equivalency of electronic documents as compared to physical paper instruments, um, uh, physical paper documents, and the same applies here again and is confirmed in the ECA with limited exceptions, which we see on slide 20, notably any negotiable instruments. So think of letters of credit, uh, promissory notes, and also powers of attorney. 
For those of you regularly taking security under the Bank Act, we still recommend continuing to insist on origi original wet ink signatures on your notices of intention. The Bank of Canada approved email filings in early April as a temporary operational measure, quote unquote, um, as part of their COVID-19 response. But in case this temporary measure is canceled suddenly uh, and will likely be without notice to you, ask, we, we suggest you just ask for the original wet ink, ink signature up front if at all possible. Next slide, please. Okay, so valid, ensuring validity uh, with a, a digital or electronic signature. So in order to ensure you're taking valid electronic signatures, you need to ensure the authenticity of the signature um, and you need to put in place a process for ensuring the integrity of the fixing of the signature to each document. All parties must also consent, even if implicitly, to using electronic signatures. Um, next slide. Uh, and in terms of best practices to making sure uh, you're taking it valid electronic signatures, what's most important here is if the signatures are not being digitally tagged by the software that's being used, so DocuSign does this automatically, um, make sure that you have that incumbency certificate that we talked about, which sort of matches up and confirms that the digital signature is, is the same as a signature that's being certified by uh, the, the signature of the signing officer that's being certified under the officer certificate. If your documents are not being handled by counsel, you should lean on trusted software like DocuSign to take care of this for you, um, or you need to take steps to create evidence through email correspondence or carefully taken notes on how and when the digital signatures were applied to the documents and then transmitted to you. If your documents are not being signed on closing, but instead are being signed in advance or before the documents get settled, you need to get it in writing that the signatures provided in advance are to be treated as affixed to the later finalized versions of the documents. And then best practice would be to get additional confirmation in an email or in writing for greater certainty that the electronic signature pages can be slip sheeted into the finalized versions of the documents. Again, on the consent aspect, you need to ensure that it's clear the parties have agreed to use electronic signatures so we suggest you bake that understanding into a standalone clause in each document and your counsel can provide you a sample language. But if the, do if the volume of the documents is too great to revise each document to include that clause, um, you can consider using a standalone agreement around the use of electronic signatures on all of the loan documents. And again, any, any lawyer should be able to give you a good example to work from. So that is all from us on the presentation side of things. Thanks everyone again for watching. Uh, we hope that you'll join us in the Q&A session immediately after this when we close the presentation so we can connect with you and answer some of your questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.